All right. Welcome back to the show. I am Dan Edwards. This is Seattle's Eastside Real Estate Podcast. I am the managing broker and real estate agent with the Eastside Real Estate team. We are going to welcome in our next guest, and I'm actually going to find her banner first. Let's see if I can. There it is, Main Sale Financial. We're going to welcome to the show, Samantha Kennedy. Welcome to the show, Samantha. Thank you so much, Dan. Wonderful to be here. So we've got, um, you know, there's a lot of lot of uh, turmoil right now in the market. So I think it's great to have somebody with your expertise on. But before we get into our questions for the day, why don't you tell me a little bit more about what motivates you? Um, uh, what motivates you? Well, actually, wait, 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 wait. I, I, I actually need to do this because this is a pretty epic story. So Samantha's life is full of miracles. At the age of three, she was adopted from China to a loving family after being malnourished and with little stability. When S Samantha looks back, she realized her journey has taken her not from knowing where the next meal was coming from to supporting others to plan for their future through her role as a financial advisor. The desire to help individuals and families prepare for a financially stable future while developing lifelong friendships is what provides Samantha purpose. She finds joy in celebrating her clients' wins as well as being a resource while they're freaking out about today's current market. I added that part. Without uh, with seven years in the financial services industry, Samantha has discovered uh, no two people, no two couples have the same dreams, and there's always more to learn. So that's your introduction. Welcome to the show, Samantha. Tell us about your big why. Yes, and I'm so happy you shared a little bit about my background, Dan, because that matters a lot. Um, I am inspired every day, and I feel incredibly blessed that my, quote, job is to learn people's stories and figure out how can I perhaps be a resource for them, not only just today, but ideally their life. So my why is essentially figuring out how can I be a resource to as many people as possible, whether that's through education, one-on-one -on -one investment advice, or even from a larger perspective through larger networking groups to share some financial knowledge that isn't taught in schools. Now, a little bit under the hood, which I think a little bit of my background information is helpful to know is at the end of the day, I'd love to be involved in foster care and adoption communities. And then a little bit also on the side is I do have a passion to coach cross country or track for a high school team. And so um, a huge advantage is, especially in the financial industry, I can be a resource to my clients, but it also presents a field where giving back is, um, I won't say easy to do, but definitely possible while growing your business. That's awesome. So I've got a question here. It says, how does your why relate to fire? Uh, what are we lighting up here? Yes, you got it. So what is the FIRE movement? So this is sort of um, a new catchy phrase out there. And what FIRE stands for is financial independence and retiring early. So connecting back to the why, I think financial independence can be sort of a catchy phrase thrown out there. And at the end of the day, it means something different to everybody. For some people, it can be when do I no longer have to work? I think that probably is a question most of us ask ourselves. Um, for other, it's when can I maybe work part time? And then for even some couples I work with, it's not necessarily when do I not work? It's when do, when can I have income not be tied to the work I do? And mm -hmm. so that's the first part of FIRE. <laughs> um, the retire early part, that's always a little bit interesting because I think depending on the type of career one's had, um, we, we have sort of a separation in demographics at this point. There's some people who have pensions, have been with their company for 20, 30 years, and the retirement is looking very, very solid. And they have high income even when they choose to stop working. Um, for other people retiring early, I think finding a philanthropic goal, and many people I work with are motivated to find um, a passion sometimes outside of work. And so when we say retire early, I think in, in respect to the financial world, it's figuring out how can we support the lifestyle that one wants to live and ideally be supportive of that and help them pursue their passions um, outside of just personal finances. That's awesome. That's straight fire. You know what I mean? That's, <laughs> you got it. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry for any future people watching this and going, why is he being so weird? All right, so financial <laughs> planning has changed quite a bit. How has it in the past few years? It has, and I will even take a step back and say not just financial planning, but I would argue almost every industry has drastically changed over the past few, past 
two, three years, going through a pandemic, um, technology becoming more and more accessible. And it used to be events in the world were not, um, I guess, realized or not as instantaneous as it is today. So when we talk about financial planning, What's different is the roadmap we build today needs to be flexible. Um, at the end of the day, at least in the United States, we're not sure if Social Security will be around. We don't really know what will happen next year, let alone five, 10 years down the road. So how financial planning has changed quite a bit compared to 10, 20 years ago is we want to build a roadmap and sort of a foundation, but at the end of the day, the monitoring, the ongoing support, having that relationship with someone who understands your goals is even more important because your goals might change along the way, but the world is ever changing. And I think if the last few years hasn't taught us that, I'm not sure what more needs to happen to want to be sure there's yeah, two hands behind the if wheel. You, if you've not waked up to things are different, uh, I don't know. You've been asleep. It's definitely for sure. Exactly. All right. So what are you doing to protect clients given the current volatility? Yeah, great, great question, Dan. Um, I figured I would break this up into a couple segments. So as you can imagine, risk tolerance or what is um, the amount of risk one is willing to take is a huge piece to this question. So when we talk about market volatility, um, it cracks me up a little bit. Market volatility is usually only recognized when markets go down. At the end of the day, if markets are going up, that is also volatility. It's just yeah. volatility we enjoy. <laughs> and right. so if we have clients closer to retirement, five, 10 years, what we're doing well before a market downturn or when we have those up and down is we're generating enough liquid reserves or cash equivalents so that they don't have to worry about their lifestyle for two, three years in advance. So our clients who are in retirement, I, I don't want to say we don't necessarily care about what the market's doing, but for their quality of life in retirement, at least for the next two, three years, Years, it's out of sight, out of mind. And that is the long term approach to investing. We don't ever want to be in a position where we have to sell a position at an, an opportune time or generate cash because there's an emergency or something out of left field that we didn't quite account for. Now, that's a little bit more long term picture. For our younger clients, or maybe clients who have 15, 20, 30 years more to work, the market volatility, the conversations are a little bit similar to therapy where it's let's not throw everything out the window. Let's not panic. Let's look at that long term. And so that's a little bit more of the subjective pieces um, on the more, I guess, analytical side. You can imagine that we are constantly analyzing different sectors, whether that be commodities, um, bonds are starting to become a little bit more attractive with the increase in interest rates. So when we look at market volatility, usually Usually that's a little bit of a shift as to which investment opportunities might be beneficial moving forward that perhaps haven't been attractive, at least over the past few years. Okay. So that's great. I love it. You feel like you're a counselor sometimes. All right, let's talk. It's going to be okay. Um, it is going to be okay. You know, that's the thing. Um, what are some of the biggest mistakes that you see or have heard of? Maybe your clients don't make them. <laughs> My clients are perfect. <laughs> yes. Um, you know, I think the biggest thing is making a decision out of fear or making a very rash decision. Um, when you hear headline news, when um, there's a horrible event that happens halfway across the world and markets react, um, it can be quite normal to feel reactionary and want to, to some extent, just get to safety or what we perceive as safety. But that's probably the biggest mistake you can make, at least in the scope of investing. You never want to have an investment strategy and then all of a sudden go 100% to cash because odds are it will be very difficult to re-enter the market or start investing again, if ever. And then you put yourself in a position where you have to assume that at some point you'll be confident enough to start having your money work for you again. So certainly during um, volatile times, or at least the negative <laughs> volatile times, um, the biggest mistake is just forgetting completely the long-term plan and just to some extent, trying to put out a fire. Whereas in the grand scheme of things, even this year, despite how quite frankly scary it's been, for most people, this will be an event in life. It won't be life changing. So it's keeping a level head and not panicking <laughs> when it might be very attractive to do so. Yeah, yeah, that's good. That's good advice is keeping a level head and just keep your head down, right? I mean, what can you really do about these things, these outside forces? And, you know, the time value of money shows up, shows up. And I feel this way about real estate and I feel this way about money and investments and stuff like that is 
it seems it, it seems that we can often react emotionally um and that's okay you know it is okay to be like what the heck happened to all my bitcoin <laughs> yes <laughs> don't tell anybody uh, anyways what happened to all my bitcoin it was a big old wad of cash and i was going to be a bitcoin millionaire what just happened you know so i think it's perspective you're gonna be okay awesome. you're gonna be all right you still have your health at least most of us do um, i'm gonna yes. skip ahead to great financial habits what's one thing that we could all adopt to have uh to to have a great financial habit i think the first thing is how can you treat yourself and i love a story i heard listening to a podcast so please forgive me this is borrowed but it doesn't matter how much money you're you make how much you're able to save even if the example given in the story is when someone was getting started they quite literally had 10 cents went to the grocery store and bought themselves a piece of bubble gum with a joke on it and it made them laugh and smile. And so that is probably the first thing is rather than financial planning or thinking about your finances, and um, my mother-in-law calls it the headache, <laughs> rather than viewing it as always negative, um, I think the first place to start is what are some things that excite you or what are what maybe is a small activity that you would enjoy? So you start associating it with positive experiences rather than just reactionary and negative. And then to be a little bit more specific, the very first thing that you can start doing is pay yourself. So again, it, the dollar amount does not matter, it's the habit. So if it's putting $5 into a piggy bank <laughs> each month, you're just starting to build the, I guess, maybe conscious or even subconscious muscles of you can start living a life where there isn't just scarcity. And that will pay you back in dividends and tenfold to when you are at the point where you have cash flow and you have surplus and making those investments will be a lot easier because you're already in the practice of setting something aside, whether it be in the place where it might not be a ton right now. So um, first thing is have a little fun. Um, second thing is save something for yourself, even if it's $5, so that you have something for the future and you start building that habit. Yeah, I was actually looking on my phone because there it's it's called Atomic Habits. It was in my mind, I'm like, what is it? What is it? Atomic Habits. They say in order to create really good, powerful habits, you need to associate something that, that may like you need to turn it into a positive, right? Mm -hmm. So associating, um, I, I am doing the right thing with something that you like to do, or I'm doing, you know, you're saving, but you're celebrating it, right? Figuring out a way to couple the two so it doesn't become that negative, like, oh, I guess I gotta put money in savings. Say, oh no, I get to put money in savings and I go get to spend, you know, this over here. So couple the two together. It's a, a atomic habit uh, kind of piece. I love yeah, that. That's a great phrasing. Um, so sprinkling a little bit of fun in your financial plan. Mm -hmm. So I think maybe looking a bit big picture. For some people, this can be a big vacation. Maybe you have, um, oh gosh, the wor the word's escaping me, not wish list. Do you happen to know, Dan, what's that list, that bucket list? There we go. Completely yeah. escaped my mind, that one. Maybe you have a bucket list. And what are some experiences you would love to have? But when you think about them, you're like, oh gosh, they will never happen. Um, having, I guess, realistic goals <laughs> is important, but also having goals that you're just excited. It's something that's rewarding and sort of those atomic goals circle, circling back or atomic habits circling back to that. Anything you can have that's positive reinforcement will make it even more likely that you stick to a plan because when it's hard and when you're still building the habits, you have that event or that trip or experience to look forward to, which um, at least for most people tends to be a little bit more motivating on the smaller scale, just that example of buying um, a little piece of bubble gum with a joke. Maybe it's, I don't know, every other weekend you get to go to a local farmer's market and you have 20 bucks to spend on whatever you want. Um, I think not having limitations for some parts of your financial plan is incredibly important because a lot of it is inventory and bookkeeping. And so you want to find that balance of uh, what's the serious part. All you on the carpet though, you know, buying a piece of bubble gum is fun, but going to Cabo is much more fun. So yeah, my scaling. suggestion in this is to give yourself a big goal. And when you mm -hmm. achieve that big goal, it should serve you financially in a yes. way that you could afford to buy that trip to Cabo, right? There you go. I've done that before. Like I, I write out my goals for my team and, and all of that stuff. And then I say, okay, and if we do this, I'm going to do that. And it's like a total stretch goal and it's a stretch reward. So I'm just making a suggestion. Bigger. Yeah, that's great. Cause and effect. And any positive association you can get will just be a win long term. <laughs> awesome. 
Well, super great conversation. I think it's really healthy to talk about like what Tucker and I talked about and then bring you in to kind of talk about how to stabilize that side of things because it really is balanced. Um, so um, how do people get a hold of you? Yes, I can be contacted via email. My personal email is samantha at maincellfg.com or you're welcome to call and text the number on the screen 425-679-6736. Thanks so much, Dan. Thank you, Samantha. It was a pleasure to have you on. Now, next up, we are going to welcome Jeanette Baton and we're gonna talk about spending some of that money. So you reached a super awesome goal and then you get to meet up with um Jeanette my favorite amazing artist when it comes to real estate so let's see oh I gotta find my oh there it is my uh commercial so we'll be right back after this short commercial break